Hello everyone and welcome to the Biology 211 lab. In this lab we will begin our second module and in this module we're going to learn how mutations affect the behavior of this microscopic worm, C. elegans. Over the next couple weeks in lab and lecture we're going to look at this process of going from a gene to a protein and then observing a phenotype. And then we're going to learn how when we generate a mutation in this gene that it will make a mutant protein and then this mutant protein will have some altered phenotype. Sometimes this altered phenotype can be lethal to the, to the organism. Sometimes it can lead to a novel function. Sometimes these mutations can have no effect at all. But having a nice convenient assay like we're going to talk about over the next couple labs is essential in understanding how a mutation can affect a given protein. And we'll see as we go forward here that to test this with the worms, at least in this assay, we're going to do a, a chemotaxis assay. And we'll talk more about this later, but you can tell in, from the name of the word here, chemo for chemical and taxis for movement, that this will be an assay that will look at how the worms move or don't move towards a particular chemical. Okay, so let me go ahead and provide a brief overview of what we'll be doing today. Prior to meeting with your teammates, I'll need you to complete worksheet 2.1. In completing worksheet 2.1, you're gonna to wanna to read this paper by Bartman. A link to this paper is found under week three of your lab blackboard show. And then when you meet with your teammates, you will all begin module two. And in this model, as I said on the previous slide, we're gonna be working with C. elegans. Now what is due this week on th Thursday at 11.59 p.m. are these two worksheets, the pre-lab and worksheet 2.1, which is three different parts to it, and it is 21 points. And if you're paying close attention, you may have noticed I quickly changed the value of the points because it's actually worth a few more points than, than it usually is. Just to give you a frame of reference of, of where we're going, this is the first lab for our C. elegans module. We'll have two more days that will look at data from experiments with C. elegans and the chemotaxis assay. And then we're gonna have two days next week that the first one is devoted to a peer editing day where you'll peer edit the introduction, the results, and the discussion. And then a final day here, which will be devoted to writing. Just time on for yourself to write to get your full lab report done. So that's where we're going. So let's begin with a brief introduction to C. elegans. C. elegans is one of several really good model organisms that geneticists use. Every model organism has some unique features to it that makes it a valuable model organism. And so let's go over some of the features that make C. elegans a strong model organism to study genetic phenomena. C. elegans has a very short life cycle. It can go from embryo to adulthood in about three days. And then it has about a two week lifespan. It's relatively small. A lot of genetic model organisms tend to be small. This makes studying them and storing them easier. C. elegans is also a model organism that is relatively cheap and relatively easy to maintain. This is important because if you're going to be growing a lot of a particular organism in a lab like C. elegans, you're gonna need a lot of reagents and if it is cost prohibitive, it no longer is a viable model organism. And being easy to maintain also makes it a much nicer organism to have in the lab. It's transparent. Now not all model organisms are transparent, but this is something that makes C. elegans unique. One can see through C. elegans under the microscope. This makes it easier to study internal organs of C. elegans as you can see here in this picture right here. They produce a large number of progeny. This is incredibly important. This is why organisms like C. elegans or fruit flies or yeast or bacteria or Arabidopsis are ideal model organisms to study genetics. If you're studying a genetic phenomena and they're only producing two progeny per generation, that doesn't allow you to calculate the proper probabilities. This is why elephants are not necessarily a good model organism. It has a sequenced genome. This is a very important feature. It's not necessarily very unique anymore because many organisms that are studied in the lab have a sequenced genome, but having a sequenced genome makes studying the genetics of, a, of an organism like C. elegans much easier. Mutants are easy to detect. If the mutants looked just like C. elegans here, the, the what we call the wild type worm, then it would be hard to know if you were looking at a mutant or a wild type. So you need to be able to see distinct features in the mutant and when compared to the wild type. If you want to learn more about C. elegans, we're lucky to have two faculty members in our department 
who study C. elegans. Dr. Karp and Dr. Skiza both use C. elegans as a genetic model system in their research projects. If you're interested in learning more about what they do, make sure you make an appointment to meet with them and talk about their research. I'm, I'm sure they would be very interested in talking with you about their projects. Another interesting feature of C. elegans is that they can exist as hermaphrodites, meaning that they can produce their own sperm and their own eggs in the same worm, so they can self-fertilize. So this is considered an asexual form of reproduction because they do not require another worm in order to reproduce. Now in comparison to the other sex of the worm, the male here, we can see that the hermaphrodite is larger and you can see that the tail here is what we say tapered. It starts off broad and ends up very thin. Now the males shown down here, as you would imagine, they only produce sperm, they do not produce eggs, and they can mate with a hermaphrodite. Now I said earlier that the hermaphrodite doesn't need to mate with another worm, but if a male is present, it can mate with the male. There are no female specific C. elegans. They tend to be smaller, as you can see in this diagram, a little thinner and faster. And their tail is also a very, has a very distinctive fan-like structure here. The life cycle of the worm here is also something worth noting. You have your adult worm here. The adult then lays the egg here, which is a fertilized egg. And this fertilized egg then develops into the first larval stage, then the second, the third, and the fourth larval stage, which then becomes the adult. C. elegans does something very interesting here. At the L2 stage, it can enter what we call dower stage. And in dower, the worm exists in a state of inactivity. This allows the worm to survive different kinds of stresses that might be present. So it's a protective stage. And not all worms, when they go through their life cycle, go through a dower. Dower only exists if it is needed to protect the worm. And it can stay in dower for quite some time. When it exits dower, it enters L4, and then it becomes an adult. Okay, now let's move on to what you're gonna do for the lab, or before the lab. So before the lab, you have a bit of a pre-lab exercise. And this needs to be done before you meet with your team for the first time for, for lab 2.1. What you need to do is review the Bargman paper and complete the questions for the pre-lab for lab 2.1. So let me show you where you can find all that information. So to find the Bargman paper, go here to June 3rd, which is, the, which is for lab 2.1, and you'll see two papers, Bargman and the Corsi et al. The Corsi paper will be a good paper as you begin to write your full paper for this module. It, as well as the reference in it, will be useful resources for you. However, let's open up the Bargman paper. What you want to do here with the Bargman paper is to review it, read it over, but while you're reading it, focus on the questions that are found in the pre-lab. And the pre-lab is found within week three worksheets. And week three worksheets is on your Blackboard page for the lab under week three. So what you'll want to do as you're reading the Barkman paper is answer these seven questions. Some of the answers for these may be found in the lab manual itself for lab 2.1. So you want to look in both places. Okay, now that you've had the pre-lab done, your team can meet, and when you meet, go ahead and go over the pre-lab with your team. Make sure your answers agree with, with your teammates. Now the entire class is going to be responsible for the questions and answers on the worksheet 2.1 part one. However, not everybody has to come up with those answers independently. Let me explain what I mean. If you're in team one or team two, you're responsible for table one and figure two, which corresponds to pages 516 and 517. And to answer the questions found in worksheet 2.1 part one that refer to table one and figure two. If you're in teams three or four, you're responsible for figure three questions. And finally, if you're in teams five or six, you're responsible for the results questions that are linked to pages 518 and 519. Now let me back up real quick. This doesn't mean that teams one and teams two have to work together, or teams three and four have to work together, or teams five and six have to work together. It just means that teams one and teams two are assigned these. If the two teams want to get together, that's fine, but you don't have to. Now, what I went you to do is have a representative from teams one or two post the answers related to your section's assignment. So if you're in teams one or two, have somebody from one of these teams post the answers from worksheet 2.1 part one that correspond to your section. Same thing with three and four. You'll post those as well that correspond to the section you're responsible for. 
and likewise teams five and six. And I will want you to post those two, and I will want you to post those to the MS Teams channel, Biology 211 Labs. Each student must answer all of the questions. And so what I want you to do, in addition to the questions your team was assigned, the other questions you should get from looking at what's posted on Biology 211 Labs channel for the MS Teams. Look at the questions, look at those answers, and make sure that they make sense. Because you don't want to accidentally put down a wrong answer. So what's due? On Thursday, the pre-lab and the worksheet 2.1 part 1. I say that the pre-lab is due today, but all I mean is that you need to show your team that you've done it, and then you can make sure you have the same answers. But ultimately, you'll turn it in on Thursday. Let me show you on the worksheet pretty much exactly what I just said but maybe it'll make more sense when you're looking at the worksheet. So here's worksheet 2.1, parts one through three, and then this is part one. So if you're in teams one and two, you'll answer these questions here, one through four. If you're in teams three or four, you will answer questions one, two, three here. If you're in teams five or six, you'll answer questions one through four. Now, as I said on the last slide, when you turn this in, you need to have answers for all of these. To answer the questions that were not assigned to you, so if you're in Teams 1 or 2, you have these answers because you work together to get them, but you don't have these. Look at the team channel in Biology 211 Labs to find these answers. I'd look them over to make sure that they seem to make sense and that they answer the questions, but most of your work should be spent on the questions you were assigned. Now let's move to Lab 2.1, Part 2. And in this part of the lab, what you're going to do is you're going to observe C. elegans. You're going to look at wild type and three mutants. I'd like you to read the microscope use section in the lab manual, and then I would like you to observe some mutants of C. elegans. So in the next slides, what I'm going to do is show you videos of examples of what we call N2, and that is what we refer to when we talk about wild type worms in C. elegans, and then these three mutants. First one is DPY3, which is commonly referred to as a dumpy phenotype, UNC54, which is commonly referred to as an uncoordinated mutant. And then the last one here is roll six, which is commonly referred to as a roller. Now, as I show these videos to you, what I'd recommend that you do is take a few notes on them because you're gonna need those in a little bit to complete the rest of this activity. So take notes on their appearances and their movements. Then what I want you to do is go to Blackboard and in Blackboard I will have a folder that has four different videos in it. One of the videos will show wild type, one will show DPY3, uncoordinated, and roll six. However, you won't know which is which. They'll just be labeled A, B, C, and D. And then it'll be your job to tell me which one of those four, A, B, C, or D, is wild type, and which one's DPY3, which one's UNC54, and which one's roll six. So first, let's take a peek at the four videos showing wild type and the three mutants. Okay, now the next four videos are gonna show you the wild type plus the three mutants. I want you to take a note of their size, their relative shape, and their movements. I'll give a little bit of a description, but most of, of the description will have to come from you so that you can identify the correct worms when you look at the unknowns on your own. All right, so here's wild type, or what we refer to as N2. And you can see it's having a very smooth, coordinated movement. They made it move back and forth here by touching it but you can see it has a very coordinated movement. We're gonna play it again so you can see it moving in the correct direction here. See how the tail is here, tail is here, and it's moving in this nice coordinated movement in one direction, and then it backs up. Okay, so this is our first mutant, DPY3. You can see it doesn't have the same shape. I'm gonna back up here. It doesn't have the same shape as the wild type. It's not quite as long. It doesn't have the same kind of tail, the whip tail. As you're looking at it, sometimes it's described more as a, kind of like a cigar shape versus the classic shape of it. As we rewatch this here, sometimes they move like this and sometimes they don't move very much at all. But one of the key hallmarks of it is it's kind of dumpy looking shape. Okay, this next one is gonna be the unc mutant, the uncoordinated movement. And as you're looking at this, 
worm here, you can see that it has kind of a similar shape as the wild type, but not exactly the same. But most notably, you can see that it's not moving in a coordinated way that allows it to get from point A to point B. It's kind of just rocking back and forth, so to speak. Sometimes the unk mutants can have a little bit more mobility, but in general, they just kind of seem to be a little bit lost in how they can move, like I said, from point A to point B. Okay, this is our roll six mutant, and let's take a peek at it. This is one of the more interesting ones, I think. See how this worm here, it's just, it's not moving from forward or backwards. Instead, it's just rolling around itself here. You may want to rewind this a little bit so you get a better look at it. But as you're watching this, you can see how it is not really moving very well. Or if this, this one up here, you can see it's just kind of rolling around in a circle. Kind of spinning. Here's another one just rolling in around in a circle here. And not really getting again from point A to point B. So kind of like the unk mutants, except the difference is this one's rolling and the, and the unk mutant was just kind of going back and forth. This one's rolling around. And one last example here. After you watch those videos that I just showed you with the wild type and the three mutants, and you've taken notes about them, then move over here to lab 2.1 folder in your Blackboard shell. And then click on the four mutant videos. Within this folder will be four videos that you will watch, A, B, C, and D. And then on worksheet 2.1 part two, you will identify which of those four videos, A through D, is wild type, unk54, dp3, or roll6. And let's look at your worksheet just so you know what I'm talking about. So here's the worksheet, module 2.1, part two. And this is what I'm talking about, our four samples. Then you'll identify if it's wild type, dp3, unk54, or roll6 in this column. And then you'll justify it by describing the shape and the movement or other comments you might have. Okay, the last thing that you'll do for this lab 2.1 is this third part of your worksheet. And this is introducing you to bioinformatics and molecular genetics. Now, the really nice thing about model organisms is that most of them have really powerful bioinformatic databases that stores all the genetic information that we know about them in one place. It makes studying different features of model organisms much quicker. In C. elegans, the database they have is called WormBase. What I want you to do is go to your lab manual on pages 63 to 65 and follow those instructions after you log into WormBase. And then you'll want to answer the questions on the worksheet 2.1 part 3. There's like seven or eight questions that you'll have to answer, but in answering those questions, you're going to walk through a series of steps using WormBase. One of our main goals of this module, working with C. elegans, is to make the critical connection of understanding how gene mutations affect worm behavior. And for you to understand that how gene mutations in any organism can affect other organisms' behaviors. So how do mutations in genes affect proteins and phenotypes? Now recall from class the central dogma, that is going from DNA to RNA to protein. And in this way, there's a relationship between the DNA or the genotype and the protein or the phenotype in most cases. Okay, just as a reminder, you will complete worksheet 2.1 part three, which is all this up here. And that's due Thursday at 11.59 p.m. And I'll leave this in your PowerPoint in case you want to refer to it. But this just helps remind you of the central dogma going from DNA to RNA to protein and how that DNA is transcribed to RNA and that RNA is translated to protein. And this genetic code over here may be useful for you as well. Now looking ahead to next lab, you'll want to read lab 2.2 on the chemotaxis assay. In this lab, you'll learn a little bit more about the behavioral assay, that is the chemotaxis, and you will design an experiment. Remember the worksheets associated with today's work, worksheet 2.1, parts one through three, and it doesn't say it here, but remember the pre-lab is also due 
on Thursday at 11.59 p.m. That's all I have for this particular podcast describing Lab 2.1. If you have any questions at all, make sure you reach out to myself or to your Lab TA and we'll answer any questions you might have. Good luck and I'll talk to you later. Bye.